Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, MBS Chorus for Small Works. Thanks for joining. My name is Kate Brown and I work in the marketing team here at MBS. On today's webinar, we're going to, we are going to showcase MBS Chorus for Small Works and the benefits it will bring to your practice. MBS Chorus for Small Works is a brand new package created specifically for architects, engineers and designers who write specifications for smaller works and projects. These types of projects could include simple jobs that are not overly technically complex, domestic projects, refurbishment, refurbishment projects or small new build projects. MBS Chorus for Small Works includes all the powerful features available with a subscription to MBS Chorus, but with a new specially selected library of content in a cost effective package for small works. Before we get started, I'll just run, run through some quick housekeeping. The webinar will last roughly one hour. Everyone's microphones are muted, but you can ask questions throughout the session using the question box on your screen. And we'll follow up with these after the session. Your speakers for today are Dr. Stephen Hamill, Innovation Director at NBS, myself, Kate Brown, and David Bain, Research Manager at NBS. So here's what we'll cover today. David will talk about the importance of specification and look at some of the research behind the small works package and why we've developed it. Then Stephen will show you the NBS course for small works and we'll do a live product demonstration showing you all, all of the key features and how you can use it on your projects. And then I'll finish off by talking about the next steps and what you can do to get started with NBS chorus. I'll now hand over to David. Thanks, Kate. Hello, I'm David Bain, and I'm going to take you through some of the research that we've done, which has helped us to develop the Small Works version of Chorus. Our understanding of the needs of those carrying out Small Works comes from a range of sources, including ongoing customer feedback surveys, interviews, focus groups, and workshops. We've been conducting some of these projects over many years, so we've built up a lot of understanding and knowledge about what's most useful to people who need to write specifications. You might see have seen some of the reports that we've produced based on some of our surveys and research, like the BIM report and the specification report and the contracts and law report. Um, these reports, uh, in some cases, we've been producing for many years and done multiple surveys over time. So we've got a good idea of the trends uh, of what's happening in the industry and the things that are important to people when they're writing specifications, including things that are important to people when they're carrying out small projects um, and perhaps less complex projects. So in, over the next few slides, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the things that we found out from doing this research um, and the things that people have told us about why specifications are important, um, how using MBS can help to address some of the challenges of writing specifications, uh, and what's then led us to develop MBS Chorus for Small Works. So why specifications are important. So kind of going back to basics really, um, and based on some of the things that people have told us when they've been talking about specifications, the specification is it's a key contractual document. So it conveys the design intent and the client requirements um, to, to those that have to construct the building. Um, it sets out performance requirements and it provides the essential information to, to aid construction and to make sure that the asset that's produced um, is of a high standard and the quality that the client desires. So we looked at these, these kind of fundamentals of specification when we carried out our specification research um, a few years ago. Um, and these are the kinds of things that people told us when they, when they took part in that survey. So you can see here some example quotes uh, from design professionals that completed that survey, uh, explaining in their own words what's important um, and, and what, what the actual purpose of a specification is. So that all sounds great when it works um, as it should do, but unfortunately things don't always go to plan. So projects can experience delays, as I'm sure uh, many people know um, and have experienced themselves. So sometimes at the end of the project or as, or as uh, the client starts to see how it's unfolding, uh, they may feel they haven't got what they wanted. Um, and you know if things kind of get, get to a point where um, they're unhappy enough uh, or one of the parties is unhappy enough, projects can go into dispute. So in our last contracts and law survey, just over one third of professionals that completed that survey said that at least one of their projects went into dispute in the previous year. For some, it was as many as five projects or more um, during a you know one one year period. 
One of the reasons for projects going into dispute can be problems with technical information like specification. Over a quarter of respondents to that survey said that poor specification um, does actually impede project progress. So, so getting the specification right can lead to uh, the reduction in the likelihood of disputes. And when disputes happen, they can be expensive. So, so no one really, no one wants disputes to happen on a project. Um, over three quarters of disputes uh, that people talked about in in the, our contracts and law survey were worth over fifty thousand pounds. So, a sizable amount of money. Um, disputes can also then lead to delays where the project um, can be put on hold or can or can stop completely. Um, in a, in a fifth of cases, the project had stopped, uh, and disputes can take a long time to resolve. So as well as it being a problem for that project um, and an issue for all the parties involved, in particular the client, who then has to wait for their building to be delivered, uh, they can also damage reputations um, and, in, and potentially inhibit the chances of the design practice getting further work from that client or other clients, even if potentially that, that dispute wasn't their fault. So because of the potential for disputes and, and, and litigation when things go wrong on projects, design practices have told us that having a good specification um, and sometimes that means using MBS as the basis for this helps to give the peace of mind that they need. Um, so on one of our uh, projects that we that we undertook uh, to help us properly understand um, why people write uh, good quality specifications and why they use MBS, these are the kind of reasons that they told us that that having that peace of mind, um, which comes with a, a good quality, well written specification that's clear. For the, for the contractor and the parties involved can help to reduce the likelihood of there being any kind of comeback or disagreement on the project uh, that, and potentially um, an issue which might lead to a dispute or a disagreement about the project. So while a good specification can help to protect, protect designers and clients, um, what it also does um, is help to encourage a, a less adversarial way and a more collaborative way of working. So, so kind of looking from a more positive point of view, um, and and hopefully the way that the industry is is, is going um, with, with initiatives like BIM, which help to encourage collaboration and people working together and, and better communication, um, we believe and and the the research that we've carried out uh, suggests that people working in the industry believe that a specification can help to improve communication, um, and it can promote collaboration. Um, and therefore, it, that, that in itself is, is less likely to lead to disputes um, if all parties are working together with a shared understanding of what the project needs to deliver. Um, and in some of our research that we've done, again, going back to the specification survey that I mentioned earlier, um, people agree that collaborative projects are less likely to result in disputes. Uh, so 70% of people agreed with that. Um, and that they're also more likely to uh, ensure that the client's objectives are delivered on a project. And people see that you know the future is a collaborative one. You know, nearly, nearly three quarters of people see that specifications will involve more co collaboration as we move forward in time. But let's talk a little bit now about the challenges when writing specifications. You know, if we all agree that a good specification um, is, is the way forward, we need to understand uh, what's involved in actually creating that specification. So you know, we hear consistently from um, our customers and people working in the industry that, that lack of time can be a real challenge um, when, when, when trying to balance writing specifications, developing the design, um, getting in more work so there's a continual kind of um, flow of work coming into the business. You know, these, are, these are all challenges. Um, and, and what it can mean is that uh, specification writing can be rushed. So over half of the people that filled in our specification survey said that they often rush the specification writing process. That, that in itself can, can sometimes lead to more chance of it, there being errors, which of course can then affect um, the communication of the information to the contractor and, and then that can result in complications and, and again potential uh, disputes about what's been specified and um, what actually needs to be constructed. As well as time, uh, people need the knowledge to write specifications. Um, uh, you know, a lot of knowledge is built up over time um, from professionals working in practice. Um, and the more experienced people are, perhaps the, you know, the easier it is to write those specifications and do them quickly. But as people retire from practice or people move on, that, that knowledge can be lost. Um, 
there's a, there's a lot of information to keep up to date with. Um, the information landscape is constantly changing as standards and regulations are introduced or superseded. Manufacturers' products evolve, um, and the technology that people are using changes. Yeah, all of these things are happening, um, you know, quite a lot at the moment. Um, we're, we're in a period of digital transformation where new platforms are being developed and evolving all the time. Um, new ways of working through things like BIM and and uh, new technologies are becoming available, which can speed up the process of design and and producing technical information. But of course, there's there's information and knowledge there which needs to be gained and brought into the business. Um, so it's it, it's a challenge to keep up with that, um, and we can see that. Um, Practices recognise that, where again, over half of people that did our specification survey felt that there wasn't enough knowledge in their practice to write specifications. And um, even though specifications are recognised as being important, um, you know, for some people they're they're not the most favourite they're their most favourite task that they need to do. Um, so again, making it easier, making it potentially you know a more positive experience uh, is something that could perhaps help uh, to to kind of um, improve the whole kind of practice and experience of writing the specification. So, so we found in our research that people do recognise there are quite a few difficulties uh, that people experience um, with specifications, either either writing them or, or when they're passing them on or, or, or working with specifications other people have written. 46% um, of people uh, who responded to our specification survey said that specifications and drawings often contradict each other. Uh, sometimes there's incomplete data or inaccurate data which is being passed on for uh, the construction teams to use. Um, generally a, a lack of communication sometimes between the different disciplines whether that's between the architect and the structural engineer or, or other members of the project team for example. Um, and sometimes people you know feel that there is just poor specification writing which which can cause problems. So given given the challenges that I mentioned on the last slide, it's kind of unsurprising that, that these things might happen when specification can be such a sort of time pressured and yet uh, potentially complex um, task that, that practices need to undertake. So how do we, we at MBS try to improve that and enable good specification? So here we, on the next few slides, we've got some perspectives from users that have told us a bit about um, how using MBS has helped them to write write specifications which meet their needs. So over the years, we've listened to, to the feedback that people have given us, and we've, we've sought to understand as well as we can the challenges that, that you face when you're um, pulling together technical information in your practice. Um, at its heart, MBS seeks to provide a platform that addresses some of the key um, requirements that we've been talking around so far, which is to help reduce risk, to save time, and to aid collaboration. And here we can see some some of the experiences that, that some of our customers have talked about in the past about um, perhaps why they've moved to MBS and, and, and how their experience has changed since they've been using MBS. So, you know, in a lot of cases, um, the alternative is using Microsoft Word or Excel, um, which maybe people have perhaps started with. Um, and in the case of uh, the first uh, comment here made by a customer, that's what they were doing. When they started using MBS, they, they found how it, it was a very different experience um, and, and much better than the one they had before, um, which they're not planning on going back to. Um, in, the, in the other example, um, they're talking about how MBS keeps everything organized. Um, so all the technical information is easy to access. Um, and in these cases, these are these are small architectural practices that are uh, providing their, their experiences here. So what we do with MBS and the fundamentals of MBS is to, is to provide information in a structured format um, and in formats that are widely used based on familiar classification systems that are used throughout the industry. So specifically things like the guidance um, the comprehensive guidance that is provided in MBS, the reference to up-to-date standards that we provide, makes sure that people keep up to date um, and they don't have to do all that, that research for themselves to make sure they're using the right standards, um, the latest standards. Um, the library of manufacturer products um, also helps people to, to save time uh, by providing a range of manufacturer information structured in the format that can be easily um, copied into MBS. Uh, again, just making that, that whole process much quicker and easier and also reducing the likelihood of making mistakes or um, copying across or dropping in um, incorrect or inappropriate information. And this information is all constantly updated by our team of over 30 technical authors. So it's all based on um, experts and people that have worked in the industry um, across disciplines. 
So now I want to turn a little bit to, to MBS Chorus um, and how we've been using um, the information that we've learned about the industry to, to, to help develop Chorus and make sure that it actually meets the needs uh, of, of, of the industry going forward. So we're not complacent about um, what we've developed with MBS and we know that it needs to evolve with the times and address trends and issues um, that our customers have been telling us about. So some of what we need to understand is on a macro level. Some believe that digital technologies can help address some of the major challenges we face. Improved productivity, sustainability, health and safety. It's being encouraged or mandated in significant reports on climate change and legislation like the new building safety bill. We also note that as many digital natives move into leadership positions, we are likely to see continued adoption of digital ways of working. We believe that organisations will increasingly structure their data to make, to make it available in consistent digital formats and the legal, environmental and economic drivers will, will continue to encourage this. So when we've carried out our surveys, so this is from the, the latest BIM survey, we can see that the industry recognises that the industry is changing um, and it's, it's changing quite substantially. So digital technologies um, are changing and are going to change the way that everybody in the construction sector works. This survey was carried out before the COVID-19 outbreak, which completely disrupted our lives over the last few months. So even before that, people were expecting um, digital transformation on, on a large scale. So it, that's only likely to be uh, increased now, um, as, as many people have had to adapt and, and work remotely. And in the same survey, we, we've asked people about different technologies that they um, are planning to use or that are using now. Um, and we can see that things like cloud computing and uh, immersive technologies like virtual, augmented and mixed reality are things which, are, which many practices are using now um, and many plan to use um, over the next few years. So for example, 80% expect to be using cloud computing in the next few years. So at MBS, we need to make sure that we're enabling this for all types of project. So looking at some specifics, one of the key things, and again, particularly um, relevant now is the ability to access information anywhere on any device. Um, so this example here is looking at how people produce uh, various documents, Word documents, Excel documents or um, spreadsheet based information. Um, most of us work with these kind of documents and for many years the most common approach has been by far the use of Microsoft Office on a desktop or a laptop. But in 2020, um, for the first time we saw in our BIM survey the use of Microsoft's online version Office 365 being used by more people than its desktop counterpart. So this marks a key moment in the progression towards cloud-based ways of working. People want to be able to use platforms like MBS on any device, whether it's a Mac, PC, phone or tablet. So just talking a little bit more about BIM, um, and particularly BIM and, and, and small practices. So we've seen over the years that we've monitored the use of BIM that it continues to be adopted by more people. Um, but this does include small practices. Um, the rate of adoption isn't quite as, uh, as high as it is um, for larger practices, but in the BIM 2020 survey, we saw that 62% of small practices, that's those with 15 staff or fewer, said that they had adopted BIM. And what we find is that once small practices tend to use BIM, they recognise the benefits. Um, so three quarters say that it makes them more productive, over half said it increased their profitability, um, and just over three quarters said it reduced the risk of problems on projects. Um, but BIM is not just about working in 3D, which is one of the, the misconceptions sometimes of BIM. Um, it's about managing information and connecting the different sets of project information. So that includes things like the model, but also the specification. Um, so that's where MBS comes in, to enable BIM um, and for people to, to work in a, in a BIM environment, then we need to make sure that MBS is supporting that whole, that whole workflow. MBS has plugins to connect the specification to models in Revit, Vectorworks and Archicad. And with MBS being a browser-based, uh, MBS Chorus being a browser-based um, application, it can work on a PC or a Mac. So here we're, we're helping to enable that communication between the model and between the specification, regardless of the, the, the package that people are using to create their models. When we started showing MBS Chorus to small practices, the response was really positive. Part of making sure that Chorus is right for the industry, though, is making sure that the right content sets are available. There are different classification systems used for different purposes. 
one thing that a lot of practices required was the ability to structure their content um, around common arrangements of work sections classification because small clients and builders often require this. So we've listened to this and this content is available in Chorus and it's the content set which is used for MBS Chorus small works. So this, uh, so Chorus is available in, in the course format um, for people to carry out small works. Um, if you do find in your organisation though that you're, you're growing and you're starting to take on more complex projects where you feel Uniclass 2015 is actually more suitable then there is of course the option to upgrade to MBS Chorus which allows you to use content structured around Uniclass 2015. So the options are there in Chorus to use either of these, these classifications. So I've highlighted there some of the, the ways that we've developed Chorus um, directly in response to, to feedback and, and industry industry trends. Um, but it doesn't stop there. We obviously will continue to seek your feedback and develop MB MBS Chorus for small works to make sure it meets the evolving needs of the industry. And we'll do this through our research and ongoing contact through our customer teams. So please let us know what you think. Now we'll take you through MBS Chorus for small works. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. So, yeah, my name is Stephen Hamill, Innovation Director at MBS, and I'm going to do just a quick demonstration, no PowerPoint slides, uh, on MBS Chorus for Small Works. If you'd like to see any more of this, uh, go to our website, thembs.com, and when you sort of hover over here, you'll see the Small Works uh, information just on this menu. And that'll take you to a page where uh, you can find out the, in more detail what we're showing uh, today. So you scroll down the page, it talks about the different features. Uh, it also shows what content uh, you get as well. So we just have a look at the scope of content here. The scope of content covers uh, the sort of, sort of work that's sort of less technically complex than your sort of traditional full MBS. So if you look down small works, we have equivalent sections, just maybe not quite as complex for, for all of the major things that go into buildings. Uh, from demolition groundwork, uh, concrete masonry, structural sections. The, the, the sections that we don't cover in small works are the sort of things that you'd find on sort of large complex buildings like curtain walling or rain screen cladding. Uh, but there's a small work section for, for the majority of the content. There's also a little article in the, the knowledge area which introduces the small works project. Uh, and this is a, like a similar format to what we talked about today. So it looks at some of the previous research that uh, David shown, and then it goes through the, the, the sort of key requirements that we've heard over the year from small practices that, that hopefully meet, meet your need. So like, not tied to a Microsoft Windows PC or having to use remote desktop or virtual PCs or what have you. Out of the box, it works natively on a Mac. We know that small practices are out and about on site a lot, working from home. So you can log in as long as you've got a web browser from anywhere, iPad, iPhone, Mac, PC, as long as it's like some minimum 4G connection, which you can get pretty much all over uh, the country now. And we'll show you in a second, simple checklist way of working, uh, as simple as possible using MBS, and how our in-house technical team of around 25, 30 authors and live Variants monitor all of the changing standards so that the technical contents are always aligned to them for when you're starting projects. We look at the manufacturer content inside the product. Uh, you can pay monthly. Uh, you can upgrade when you work on sort of bigger, more uh, complex projects, and it sits inside the design tools that you use, whether that's Vectorworks, Archicad, or Revit, so you can design and specify at the same time. So. Uh, yeah, let's just say I've logged into Chorus here, so you can see I'm logged on to a, a fictitious organization, Hamel uh, Design. And uh, if you've got three license seats, three people can log in and specify at any one time. If you've got one license seat, one uh, person in your practice can log in at any one time. And then you create projects, and within those projects, you then create your, your specifications. So I just uh, delete the specs that are already in there and we'll uh, start from scratch. So fundamentally, there's two types of specifications you can create. There's sort of uh, prelims, which covers uh, 
with the building contract, but also the sort of general requirements through a project timeline. And then there's the sort of technical sections as well. So uh, first things first, we'll uh, create a set of prelims. And I'll add two JCT minor works uh, contract. So I'm going to choose the, the UK Common Arrangement of Work Sections Prelims Library. And then the contract I'm going to choose will be JCT uh, minor works. We have a JCT, JCT contract design, we have the Scottish equivalent, and we have the RIBA concise contracts. So most of the contracts that small practices need. And when I set that uh, set of prelims up now, it's going to add all of the different sections you, you need using the terminology uh, from the, the, the JCT and minor works uh, contract. So it takes a few seconds because it's adding sort of the latest 20 or so sections from MBS. And there you can see we have a sort of checklist starting from setting up your project, setting up the rules of tender, describing the work. I'll just look at a few of these. If I open this one here, there are clauses in the contract, uh, the, the details in. If a, a clause isn't relevant, you can park it off. Uh, and where something is relevant, and you come into the clause and you fill in the, the, the blanks. You can pick from the, the drop down values, or just do free text if you want as well. Across have things that aren't relevant, and then save it. And you get a similar thing. Uh, and then the sections that sort of more describe the, the, the the various work at the various stages. So lots of template clauses from MBS. We have a little look here, a nice little clause here that just defines that when you go into those technical sections, what, what does each of the phraseology mean that you uh, use? And you can just leave it as it is. Uh, again, you can remove things that aren't relevant. And you can come and amend it as well. So that's what drops down, uh, drops down there. And you click uh, save. If you want to add your own clause items in, you can come and click on the three dots and uh, insert a new rules below as well. And so that's what covers the, the, the prelims. At any stage, you can print this out. And then drop back here. And you can print it to Word, format it exactly as you want, or you can just uh, drop it straight in the PDF. You can publish the entire spec, or you can just go to work with a particular section and then uh, publish that. Just watch how easy this is PDF or Word. You can compare it to some previous revisions uh, for Chorus 2 users, which will come on to, and then put a bit of metadata in, sort of track what was the, the revision status. And when you click publish, It'll generate a nice PDF as a sort of record of you know, what you issued out of your office at that particular point in time. And you can see all the different uh, items that were previously in the editor. So a nice checklist, go through it, make it project specific, and then uh, send it to PDF. Know that that's based on content uh, that's aligned to the latest uh, standard. If I jump out of the prelims now and uh, look at the more sort of technical sections, I just call this architectural spec. Instead of basing this on the prelims content, I'll base it on the, the work sections, common arrangement of work sections. And what you'll see is you get a set of uh, content as shown on this scope of content for you to add in and using your projects. I've got a nice little search engine. If I want to add uh, concrete sections, search for concrete. And you can sort of drop those into the jobs. And uh, want to specify doors and windows. I come in this L20 for doors. Specify section here with uh, for the windows. And each one of these comes with a checklist of clauses. And there's a statements on things like the scope. You can come in and 
read the sort of scope of content and uh, see which other sections you may have to add. So you add in the windows and maybe some sections on ironmongery and uh, sealants that you have to add as well. And just like we saw with prelims, it's a checklist of uh, clauses for you to go through and make project specific. So if you've got no windows which are timber, you get rid of the clause on timber procurement. And you might know that you've got a two, two different types of aluminium when you was in those in the job. So what you can do here is a, a duplicate the clause. So I'll, I'll say I'll make the first one I'm going to call uh, window system 001. And then I'm going to come across the three dots here and duplicate the entire uh, clause. And that'll create the second copy of this and it automatically recognizes that numbering system, win 001, win 002. And there uh, that drops, drops into the job. All the technical guidance on the right hand side. Lots of manufacturer content as well, for you to pick from, from the leading uh, UK manufacturers. And of course, you can just uh, retype as well. So, uh, pick from the drop down values and uh, we type, remove things that aren't important and specify things and that, that, that are. So I come into the, the second type of window here. And this is a, a duplicate of the first, but I can pick uh, different values. Uh, should I just... If you pick from the, the product information inside MBS, then that would pop in with the, the values from that. A particular manufacturer. But uh, we've got webinars on the manufacturer content if you're interested and more on that. As I uh, drop uh, down the, the section, you, you have this sort of products more towards the top. And as you get in the base of the, of the section, you get under this sort of quality of execution as well. So you're not just uh, specifying the quality of the product uh, that you want in the project. But you also can qualify, uh, specify the quality of the workmanship and any sort of handover information as well. So uh, getting down to the bottom, you've got things like uh, joints, iron mongery, and anything on a replacement window installation and things as well. And every section's got that same sort of format, whether you're specifying windows uh, or concrete. I've come into the concrete uh, section, and you see a big checklist of things that you might want to specify in terms of the concrete. Cross the stuff out, that's not relevant. Fill in the stuff uh, that is relevant and then uh, drop it in as a sort of PDF uh, at the end. And of course, in the cloud, it's a collaborative system. So you can come and uh, add other team members as well. So if I come to the level of the project here, uh, I can come to team members and uh, quickly invite uh, another user from my practice in there. So let's say I Adam Smith, I can make him a contributor to the project, but just read only access to the prelims. And it gives you that sort of uh, permissions control to say who can do what and when. Uh, everything in chorus is a modern web platform that's sort of designed for uh, different size screens. So whether you're working on sort of iPad or iPhone, uh, it, it works really nicely. And the nice thing about the thin screen is that it drops uh, nicely into uh, design packages as well. So I've got Autodesk Revit on the screen here, but it, it works very similarly. In fact, it works at Archicad as well. And you can link the items inside the, the design to the items in the spec. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to associate this model uh, with the specification. I've come the specification I've just created, and everything's done with these little three dots you can see. So what I'm doing here is now associating the open model with the technical sections uh, from the spec. Let me just refresh that because that's still the old page from the previous uh, previous one. So I've got the model, and I'm going to link the model to uh, that particular specification. And you'll see immediately that you get a little icon pop up to show that now that's associated with the model. If you're working from a different machine uh, on the same project, 
And what you'll notice is you get reinforcement uh, of that here as well. So I can see now that that specs uh, links to a model. And then it's a case of linking the objects in here to the specifications that you've created uh, in the spec. So if I just have a little look at the, the ground floor plan here, and currently there's no differentiation between that type of window and that type of window. It's maybe a little bit lazy and just in go to L10 and see what that window is. What we're going to do is actually link the two window types to the, the windows that have been specified. So if I go here and click on this object, I can then say associate the object with one of the clauses uh, in the section. It says which one. You can see you can no longer see the timber, timber windows because I crossed those out. You can't see the steel windows. They were crossed out. But we've got window system one and window system two. And I can say that this is uh, window system one, click associate. And that's linking this object to that uh, particular uh, specification clause. And it's going to drop a couple of properties into the, in this case, Revit object, which you can use for annotations and scheduling. It's just to prove that I'll, I'll go back to the floor plan again. And you'll see that first window now is sort of annotated properly. It's not just L10, it's close 25 and it's window type one. So I go and do that to this uh, second window here. Click on the window, you can do it from 3D views, you can do it from the schedule view, you can do it from uh, the different plans and sections, do it from materials and size elements like plasterboard or uh, installation or what have you. So I click on the window, I want to find the clause in L10. It opens up all of the clauses in L10. And I'm going to link this one to, to Windows System 2. And it'll update the annotation. It links the objects. And if you've got a schedule as well, those fields drop into the, the right fields of the schedule. So they're both annotated correctly. Jump to the schedule. And you can see they, they drop into the right fields here as well and uh, yeah click anywhere and that's now going to sort of bring it up so when you're doing your design when you're writing your schedules you've got your specification there and if you've got right permissions contributed submissions to the specification you can actually uh well, why not just write the spec here on the sort of small screen if you've got two screens you can drag it off to the sort of second monitor you're going to make sort of less mistakes. You're reducing the risk of things going wrong if, as you're designing, you're specifying at the same time. If you make uh, little changes which break the links, you get warnings that come up in the model tab. So let me just deliberately uh, change the name of one of these windows. So let's just jump down and I'll call. Call this window so type A just to demonstrate how it works. So we've deliberately created a problem here that it's called win zero one in the model, but it's called type in spec. It cause confusion on the drawings when they get issued. What happens inside MBS if you put a model tab here is we've recognized that problem. So we've got three tabs here. This tab shows the objects in the model that you haven't linked yet. You can click the button and jump straight and visually see those. You can see the objects that have been linked. You can jump straight to those. And then you also see uh, where you do over time get a few little problems. Like it's called win or one in the spec, and the model is called type A in the spec. And we have buttons that help you sort of fix those. So if you want to watch on the left hand side here, fix this. And what it does in the schedule, as we sort of move across there, you'll see the win or one. And that will change the type of type A window. Revit's just doing its stuff. And it, it, it keeps everything so synchronized. So that's, that's now type, type A again. Just jumping back. There's two packages for uh, Chorus Smallworks. So if I jump back across uh, here to the Smallworks page, we have something called Chorus One, which has everything I've demonstrated today. But we also have a Chorus 2 as well. And that's just got some additional functionality uh, that, that helps you work like, as efficiently, as uh, risk-free as possible. And you can scan down this, this chart showing you what, what Chorus 1 has, what Chorus 2 or doesn't have. Little things like reporting and submittals, working with masters. 
specification notes revisions, inviting external collaborators. But just to spend two or three minutes, just like, really touching lightly on some of the core two features that you may be interested in. Uh, if I jump across to the other project, things such as uh, the ability to, to add notes. So as you're making your specification decisions, you can write little notes on the right hand side next to the guidance. And then you get a little report on all of the notes, who was the person that put the notes in. And you can just jump uh, through and it shows you that the notes it has a little picture of who's the person that made the note. And you can go and sort of reply and tr track those sort of decisions here. Another thing that you might have saw when uh, I was in this panel, you get the updates uh, panel here as well now. And this tells you where standard has changed and the NDS technical contents changed. So you can come and uh, see what's different between what's in your spec and what's in the latest version of NBS. We see the NBS here is uh, put the latest. This is actually our Australian uh, content. The principles are the same as a British standard or an Australian tech spec. You, you can see what's changed and then just click a button to, to update the spec to the latest uh, content. Uh, we have uh, the ability to keep a record of everything that's been published through the history of the project, whether they're small packages or the full spec, see who published it and then uh, get a little record of like what was the PDF that went out the office uh, at that time. So there's the, the sort of spec with the revisions and marked up. So on the table of contents and you also see what's been revised, what's been added, uh, what's been removed. So there's some nice features and codes too, but uh, the, what I wanted to do in this webinar was just basically show the base functionality of how you can quickly assemble the specification, edit it, add manufacture content, and then uh, generate a PDF. But uh, We'll maybe do another webinar in the future where we look at some more advanced functionality. But uh, hopefully that's been interesting, it's been useful. Uh, all of that is a summary is on the, the Smallworks website. You can sign up for Smallworks, which is our sort of more cost effective option. You can get monthly payment options. But as your practice grows, as the jobs you get are bigger, at any time you can upgrade, either on a functionality point of view to Chorus 2 or on a content point of view. So if you find that you uh, win a, say a school project or a complex office or healthcare project, and uh, you want to make use of the, the greater performance content, the greater scope of content, you can upgrade to the, the larger content set as well. But uh, I hope that was useful. I hope it was interesting. And I'll pass over to you now, uh, Kate. Bye-bye. Thank you, David and Stephen. We hope that you found today's session useful. If you'd like to read more about the Chorus for Small Works package, you can visit the dedicated webpage that Stephen just showed. And you can find that at thembs.com forward slash MBS Chorus forward slash Small Works. If you're an existing customer and you've recently been given access to the Small Works package and you have any questions or queries, please get in touch with your account manager and they will be able to help you. If you're new to NBS and you'd like to know more about Chorus or any of our other products and services, visit the webpage or get in touch using the email address at the bottom of the slide, which is info at the or call us on 0345 456 9594. We host lots of regular webinars and events online and um, to find out more about what we've got coming up or to watch any of our past ones on demand, visit thembs.com forward slash events. Thank you again for joining and we hope to see you soon.